five different little churches going on. All of them asking the leader, what you think? Y'all ain't gonna let me talk to you today. My brothers and sisters, I refuse to accept this as the standard by which I must minister. Brother pastors, would you listen to me tonight? Please, please listen to me. The size of my church cannot dictate the size of my vision. My vision must always be larger than my building. The size of my church cannot be measured by measuring the circumference of my property. The width of my pews does not reflect the depth of my compassion. And so many times we've allowed people to force us into some little corner and make us feel bad. And then we come to Memphis and all sit down and we don't want to talk to two because we don't want nobody to know that I don't have a big church. My brothers and sisters, the largeness of your church is not in how many members you have. It's in whether or not you are connected to the will of God for you. Can I talk to somebody here today? 1 Corinthians 6 and 20 reminds us, for we are all bought with a price. And therefore, we ought to glorify God in our body and in our spirits, which are God's. Let me tell you something. When we give up on what God has given us, and tonight as I look around this great auditorium and I see thousands of people that are sitting here, I am fighting back the tears. And I'm saying, God, give us another chance. There is just no way in the world that all of us have the Holy Ghost power and our world remains static the way it is. There's no way that can happen. Hallelujah. There's no way you can have 200 people in church. Are you with me today? And then we pass the church on our way to church. Somebody said, well, we didn't have nobody come today. Let me tell you something, friends. You passed your church on the way to church. And the reason you didn't recognize them is because they don't look like church folk. And what many of us call church growth is nothing more than people transferring from one church to another. You get five of my members, I get five of yours, and then you get five of the next week. That's not church growth. I don't hear nobody today. It's church growth when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and men and women come under conviction and come with their hands raised up saying, what must I do to be saved? Am I with no one? I don't hear nobody here today. Oh, glory to God. And it's a shame that the next generation coming up now is using many of us as a standard on which to measure their self. And so we have young men and young women who think that the measure of their success is whether or not they got a cool walk. 17 years old walking up to me, talking about, hey, doc. I said, oh my God, are you with me today? Calling me up on the phone and say, you know what, doc, you get me, I'll raise you some money. God deliver you. If the reason why you have a revival is to raise some money. I don't hear nobody today. If you need to have a rally, just say we're having a rally. Raise what you have to raise, pay off your bills and go on. But I'm not going to use a revival as an excuse. Are you with me? Not when people's lives are hanging in the balances. Not when people are there dying. Oh, God, help me here. I'm not going to use money as an excuse when people need the power of the Holy Ghost in their life. Hallelujah. God, deliver us from these patty cake sermons. Hallelujah. Preaching just to make people comfortable so we don't offend nobody. Hallelujah. If your preaching never offends anybody, I'm wondering what kind of preaching you're doing. Somebody said it up on one occasion that real preaching should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. 
Paul Shear said it right at Union in Princeton when he said nothing can do people any good without disturbing them and nothing will disturb them to any lasting effect until it disturbs them deeply. There are no prefabricated substitutes for the disturbing gospel of Jesus Christ. You're not saved today because somebody patted you on your back but some of you are saved today because you heard the gospel. You didn't get saved that day but the gospel followed you home. Hallelujah. You got in the bed and closed the door, got in the bed, and the gospel got in with you. My God, it disturbed you to where you couldn't sleep. You got up the next morning and that thing was still working on you. And finally, you made your way back to church and said, Oh, Lord, forgive me of all of my sins. I want to be saved. Somebody said, I didn't go through all of that. I didn't get saved like that. You know, I just went to church and I went to the tongue speaking class and I just started speaking in tongues. Oh, I wish I had a witness here today. Our problem is we have a Pentecostal church. Bishop Blake, you're right, but it's sad to have a Pentecostal church and nobody have a Pentecostal experience. Now, y'all didn't want me to preach in here tonight. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. Jesus was not afraid to disturb folk. My God, even when he was born, he disturbed the king. And the king said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? He was not afraid to disturb families. He's walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he sees Simon and Peter and Andrew, and call them and tell them, drop your nets and follow me. He was not afraid to disturb non-traditional families. That's why he met the woman at the well. That's a non-traditional family. But when she got through talking to her, she ran back and told Leroy, Hey, Leroy, come see a real man. I wonder, can I talk to somebody here today? Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. I'm trying to get out of here. I don't want to mess up too bad here. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The power of the gospel will disturb demons. Somebody said, don't preach on that. The devil get mad at me. He just needs to get mad. But how many know that you can't say you are a Pentecostal, born again Pentecostal, Holy Ghost filled believer and don't disturb the devil sometime? How many know that real Holy Ghost power will disturb the devil? How many know that it will disturb the devil? Hallelujah. I, I've always, I, I, I've got to figure this out. I'm glad to see Dr. Martin here. He can help me figure this out. The Bible says in Mark 1, 23, I've never been able to figure this out. He said, you ought to know that. You dear sister, I don't know this. There was in their synagogue a man. I don't get this. There's in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with the, the, the Jesus? You're going to destroy it. I know who you are. Here's why I'm confused. How long had he been there? Dr. Johnson, was he a member of the trustee board? Was he sitting in the pulpit? Was he on the Ursher board? I just know the Bible said there was a man with an unclean spirit and obviously he was comfortable in church. I can't hear nobody today. You'd be surprised how many demon-possessed folk are in church. You'd be surprised how many have positions and titles and you know yourself, you better not mess with them. I don't hear nobody today. And somebody said, well, I ain't gonna mess with them because they pay tithes. The devil is a lie. If you've got the devil in you, nothing's going to work but to take the power of Jesus and say in the name of Jesus, we cast the devil out. You'll never have peace in your church if half the folk are filled with the devil. Can I preach a few more moments here? I'm trying to close. <laughs> Glory to God. And I, I heard what the man said, Brother Johnson. He said, let us alone. And people who are filled with the devil always want you to leave us alone. I don't hear nobody today. My God, let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, there are two million people in jail. And there's somebody telling us, leave them alone. 
4% of the next generation does not even claim to believe the Bible. And somebody said, let them alone. <laughs> Just wait till they get of age and then talk to them about religion. Don't do it now. Let them make up their own mind. You can't let a child grow up without knowing Jesus. You can't let a child grow up without knowing who he is. By the time he's 18, the devil will have his mind. Hallelujah. The pornography industry that spends $57 billion a year tells us, leave us alone. The California Supreme Court, hallelujah, the other day rewrote Genesis 2 and 24. I wonder what that say. Read it when you get home. Hallelujah. When adoption centers are running over with throwaway babies, and here we are in church arguing over whose Sunday is next. I want you to hear me tonight. Church of God in Christ, please hear me tonight. Anytime we have more ministry going on the inside than we have going on the outside, it won't be long before we are out of business. Are you with me here today?